We are delighted to see all of your lovely faces, and uh, we're delighted to have Adam Stern with us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi White uh, to say some words of welcome, and then our Adult Engagement Committee co-chair, Barbara Klein, is going to introduce Adam. And um, as ever, if you have questions, and we hope that you will, feel free to either enter them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end, or you can raise hands at the end and ask them, you know, yourself. So we'll certainly allow some time for that. Rabbi White. Hey, everyone. It's it's great to see you all. I, I'm, I'm particularly excited about tonight's presentation. Um, Dr. Adam Stern is someone I'm very personally fond of, and I, I just think he's a gifted teacher and an inspiring one at that. Adam and I have spent some time together, especially most recently, and I've gotten to learn about him and his family, about his own personal health struggles and the way he has incorporated them into his practice and into his thinking about the world and thinking about his profession. Um, Adam also is a gifted, gifted writer. Um, he's written a wonderful book that I, I commend to all of you and, and as well, many articles that, that, that chronicle his, his life and, and, and his approach to life. Uh, his writing is, is elegant, inspiring, um, embracing, engaging. And as I just said to him, I, I think it, it, it expresses why I know um, he's a gifted scientist and a gifted clinician. And um, Adam grew up at Temple Sinai, so we can take a little bit of credit for, uh, for, 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 for who he has become. Um, and I'm just grateful, Adam, to you for sharing this evening with us. And I know our community is gonna learn a lot from you tonight. So, uh, so thanks for being here, everyone. And Adam, thank you for being here, especially. Well, thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, oh, and a, Adam, I'm sorry. I think Barbara Klein was just going to say a couple of right. words to introduce oh, okay. you further, and then sure. we'll get right, right to right. you. Thank you so Barbara's much. Gonna do, Barbara's going to do the real introduction. The official <laughs> introduction. <laughs> you are a hard act to follow. You are a very hard act to follow, Rabbi. Good evening. My name is Barbara Klein, and as co-chair of our Adult Engagement Committee, I welcome you to our first official program of the year. Even with the complications of Zooming, streaming, and some in-person events, we have managed to continue our tradition of interesting, entertaining, and educational programs. We urge you to watch Temple Sinai emails for further details of our upcoming events. I've made many introductions over the years, but this is the first time I've had the honor and privilege to introduce a homegrown celebrity, Dr. Adam Stern. Yes, Adam grew up right here at Temple Sinai, where he attended our nursery school and Hebrew school, and his parents continued to belong to our congregation. After attending Brown University, Adam went to Upstate Medical School and then to Harvard, where he became a psychiatrist. His book, Committed, Dispatches from a Psychiatrist in Training, is about his experiences while learning to become a psychiatrist, living with cancer, and learning the value of human connection. He vividly captures the urgency, chaos, and eerie fascination involved with the treatment of mental illness. Adam pulls back the curtain on what it's like with the mind. Extensively for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Adam appeared on CNN as a psychiatric expert during the COVID-19 pandemic. Quite a lot of background for a young man, don't you think? But I believe well-deserved. Well and so it's with great honor that I present Dr. Adam Stern. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Barbara. Uh, and thank you, Rabbi White. And thank you, Adrian, for having me. And thanks to everyone here. I can see uh, several, maybe a couple of handful of people that I know and love personally. And so I, I welcome you. And I, I want to thank everyone else for joining as well. Um, I am here to uh, talk a, a little bit about my experience in writing this book, Committed. Um, but this is a unique opportunity for me because, you know, as Barbara and Rabbi White mentioned, you know, I, I consider Temple Sinai a part of who I am. Um, 
I grew up in Roslyn. I spent the first 18 years of my life in Roslyn and I went to Hebrew school and I was bar mitzvahed at Temple Sinai. And um, it's one of the, uh, you know, complicated as everyone's individual relationship is with uh, their religion. Uh, it is a part of me. And so it's a real honor to uh, be here and to be able to speak to this particular group. I, I, I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, start out by reading the prologue, and uh, that will lead me somewhere, uh, and I hope you'll stick with me on it. So uh, for anyone who has the book, the prologue is right up front, and I'm just going to uh, read it to you. I have a recurring dream in which I look down and notice for the first time that I'm soaring above the earth. I'm exhilarated, but also filled with fear. I don't know how I made it off the ground, and the act of looking down seems to cause me to lose whatever momentum it was that propelled me upward. I need to figure out how to keep moving before gravity pulls me back to earth, ending in a terrible crash. Sometimes I awaken just as I begin to fall, and other times the dream ends with my discovery of an unexpected solution. The version that gives me the most comfort is when I look to one side or the other and notice that I'm not alone. In those moments, when I see someone floating right next to me, my fear still exists, but it's more surmountable. Maybe we can figure this out together. In my conscious life, I feel this way too. I became a psychiatrist, which was at its core, an education in the value of human connection. Psychiatry is the field of medicine aimed at helping patients to find and become the best versions of themselves in spite of or because of, or even because of, the immense challenges they face. Inherent within the field is the assumption that we're more capable together than we are apart. Psychiatrists are trained to give people a push forward when they're stagnating and to catch them when they're falling. We learn through experience that the parts of our lives we can see and hear and feel may be only a sliver of our inner world. In fact, our minds are generally so focused on the complex task of making sense of our precarious existence that sometimes we can misunderstand parts of ourselves that exist right out in the open. Here too, psychiatry can be useful in illuminating the unseen. Those of us who become psychiatrists face these same challenges in our own lives. I chose it as my specialty because I wanted to become an expert in the human condition, but I had to figure out how to square that with the gnawing sense that sometimes I could just barely get by myself. I couldn't fathom how I might grow into an intellectual and emotional guide for patients when I felt completely overwhelmed by my own rudimentary life. Coming from a state medical school in upstate New York, I had matched into a residency program at Harvard Medical School. Everyone around me at the new program was so bright and already accomplished that I didn't see myself belonging. I felt like an imposter. A version of my dream was playing out in my life then, but I couldn't see how it would end. I had found myself soaring into one of the most prestigious residency programs in the country, but I couldn't imagine a scenario that didn't involve crashing back to earth. This book tells the story of how I was transformed over those four years alongside my peers with the guidance of our extraordinary teachers. It describes how we all came together to overcome the unimaginable challenges of psychiatric training. Like many of my patients, excuse me, many of the patients who taught us by way of their own care my classmates and I changed and strove to be better. Together, we learned the meaning of failure and appreciated the preciousness of success. As a group thrust together and inseparable by circumstance, our class was taught what it meant to connect with one another and our patients. We faltered often, but still and always, we found ways to move forward together. Now, when I have to explain, uh, I have to take a moment to pause and, and explain that writing this book was the culmination of a sort of lifelong dream of writing a book for a big publishing house. The idea of it was um, quite uh, almost absurd, uh, but and yet here we are and, and it's it's happened. When it happened, you know, the publishing house, which at the time was uh, Hunt Mifflin Harcourt, they had a publicist and they would send it out to all these websites and all these newspapers, etc. And one of the websites that uh, listed it in July as eight Jewish books that we uh, are looking forward to in July was a website called Hey Alma. 
And I, I wasn't familiar with Alma, though I was familiar with its uh, larger uh, umbrella company. Um, but I, I was uh, honored and, and glad to be listed. Uh, but it gave me pause for a moment because I thought to myself, you know, I don't, I don't think that I actually mentioned Judaism in the book explicitly. And, you know, in their little paragraph about the book, they wrote uh, at the end, they wrote connection to Judaism. And it just said the author is Jewish. And that's true. Uh, and it wasn't until I was starting to think about what I might speak to this group about that I was starting to prepare. And I read through the uh, prologue that I just read to you. And I noticed something. And so I'm going to try something. It may work. It may not work. But what I want to do is reread a few pieces of the prologue, but with a slight adaptation. Now, the preface to that is that to me, I, as I mentioned, everyone has their own complicated relationship with God and their religion and the culture. And, and to me, when I think of Temple Sinai, I think of community and tradition, and I think of our, our, our group, our togetherness as a, as a people. Um, and so what I noticed was that in the prologue, if I, if I literally substitute uh, anytime I see the word psychiatry for Judaism or some field of some, something related, something interesting happens. Um, so getting to the second paragraph, um, it says psychiatry is the field of medicine. So I'll just say um, Judaism. Judaism is aimed at helping people to find and become the best versions of themselves in spite of or even because of the immense challenges they face. Inherent within the religion is the assumption that we're more capable together than we are apart. Jewish leaders, like Rabbi White, for example, are trained to give people a push forward when they're stagnating and to catch them when they're falling. We learn through experience that the parts of our lives we can see and hear and feel may be only a sliver into our broader world. In fact, our minds are generally so focused on the complex task of making sense of our precarious existence that sometimes we can misunderstand parts of ourselves that exist right out in the open and parts of our community that exist right out in the open. Here too, Judaism can be illuminating. And I wanna skip down a little bit further along uh, toward the end of the prologue when I think about how, um, when I think about our history together, we all, and I'm getting back to the reading from the book, we all came together to overcome the unimaginable, unimaginable challenges of our history. Like many, uh, uh, excuse me, together, we learned the meaning of failure and appreciated the preciousness of success as a group thrust together and inseparable by circumstance, or in our case, culture and religion, uh, our people were taught what it meant to connect with one another. We faltered often, but still and always, we found ways to move forward together. And that line at the very end, I don't know, it's, it just uh, sort of speaks to me about our identity uh, as a people together. And so I don't know what makes a Jewish book. Maybe it's not a Jewish book. Maybe I'm reaching, but it just struck me that there's so much overlap uh, between how I perceived psychiatry uh, and how I also perceive our community together. I thought I would share that. Uh, and I, I want to read a very brief section, discuss it, uh, and then read another chapter. And then the chapters are very brief. And then I'd love to open it up for questions and discussion uh, at, 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 at whatever point seems appropriate. So I'll, I'll just continue with the way the book opens, which is chapter one on page three. It's called Welcome to Longwood. Longwood is the medical campus uh, at Harvard Medical School. The room was dimly lit. The curtains hung with too much slack, letting in light from the street lamps outside the window. We stood in a patient's room at the far end of the locked psychiatry unit on the Longwood Medical Campus. I held steady in the center of the room hoping that the adrenaline rushing through my veins was evident only to me. I was flanked by three hospital security guards. One seemed to yawn in my ear as I stared up at a man, no more than 20, who was admitted to the unit in a psychotic state. 
His world did not conform to reality and his instincts or terrified thoughts had led him to climb to the top of a six foot bureau. He perched completely frozen, crouching in fear. Come on down, we're only here to help, I said in a quiet voice. You're an agent, you're an agent of the devil's CIA, he replied. Please, I pleaded even more soothingly, I need you to come down. But before I finished my sentence, he had leapt toward us. Two of the security guards intercepted him midair and guided him to the floor safely, but with a thud. A nurse entered and proceeded to inject his buttocks with a sedative as the guards held him in place. She'd had it ready from the moment she walked in. I'm so sorry this has happened, I said, kneeling on the floor and trying to make eye contact with the man. We're going to get through this together. The group escorted the man to the quiet room where he was physically tethered to the bedpost in accordance with Massachusetts legal code and the murky ethics of involuntary treatment when there's an imminent safety risk. I watched the man be tied down from eight feet away. I felt a nudge in my rib. First time, it was the nurse. It gets easier. I'm not sure that I want it to get easier, I replied. Well, now that's your stuff getting in the way. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. Come on, doctor, we've got mounds of paperwork and three admissions waiting to be seen. Then the book continues one month earlier, and I'm just going to read a, a couple of paragraphs. Have you ever seen anything like this? I asked, like an amazed child. Eliana paused to take in the immaculate surroundings and shook her head. I don't think there's any place quite like this, she replied, fixing her gaze upon my Harvard-issued ID badge. Seeing that name next to mine feels like a lot of pressure, I said. Good thing you're wicked smart, she retorted with an exaggerated Boston accent. I smiled meekly and continued examining the main quad at Harvard Medical School. This quad belongs to people way smarter than I am. Uh, so I just want to pause there and take a moment to discuss with you uh, what I think of as one of the core themes of the book, which is that uh, medical trainees, and in particular psychiatry, um, I think that um, a lot of people don't necessarily have a sense that they're really, uh, this is their first job, you know, they've been in school. When I wrote this, the, the, the era when I wrote this book, uh, in other words, the era of my life that this book takes place in, I was in my mid-20s. And I'd been in school really for most of my life before that. Um, and that first scene is designed to capture your attention. Obviously it's very intense. And I can remember that moment very clearly in my mind. Um, and that was within the first month of my residency training. And, you know, like I said, that was really like the first full-time job that I had. And it it's, there's a paradox. The paradox is, that you're as a as a new doctor, uh, which psychiatrists are in this funny little corner of medicine, uh, you're given this immense responsibility, which is to take care of. In this case, it was you know the this inpatient unit with 24 patients on it, and at the same time, you're brand new, and the system has an appreciation that you're in over your head. Everybody knows that it's sort of like uh, an understood, accepted fact. And the only reason it's okay, and I want to assure you that it is okay, is because there are senior residents that you can call upon. There are attending physicians that you can call upon. Everything you're doing is supervised and you can learn from it. But at the same time, in the moment, you don't necessarily feel like that. You feel like you um, are alone in it. And it's a lot of weight to carry. Um, one of the uh, senior um, really esteemed faculty that I trained with is a, a, a famous forensic psychiatrist named Tom Gutile. And he, at least according to residency lore, coined this term uh, that you should never worry alone. Uh, and that was something that we carried with us throughout the entire residency. If you can share, and it's something that comes through in the prologue, frankly, uh, if you can share your the weight of the job of, it, of taking care of people, then it's much more manageable. Then you can actually feel like you can do it and you won't get swept up in the dangers of it, in the emotional toll of it, in the physical toll of working for 30 straight hours or working only at night for two straight weeks and that kind of thing. Um, and so I don't know if, if Dr. Gutel 
was the first person to ever say that. I suspect maybe someone else had said it at some point because it's pretty much everywhere if you Google it. But um, it's a, it's something that I continue to advise new junior residents of, medical students, uh, anyone that I work with. And frankly, it's a good thing, I think, for, for pretty much all of us in our lives to, to carry with us. We all have worries and, and to be able to share that with our community um, and, and carry the weight of those worries together, I think is a very useful thing. Okay, with your permission, uh, unless there are objections or questions or interruptions, I'm gonna read one more chapter. Uh, and this, and then we'll uh, just open it up to discussion. Um, this chapter is, I, I wouldn't read it for any other audience, I'm gonna be honest. Um, this chapter is called Stern and Sons. And it's uh, a personal chapter. You know, it's about our personal life. If you have the book in front of you, it's on page 107. I remembered the talk David and I had as we sat in the old Jeep our father had given him as a hand-me-down a few years earlier. The year was 2002, and we were waiting for the gas tank to fill before driving home for winter break together. He was a senior in college, and I was a freshman. I had followed in his footsteps to Brown that fall. I want to be pre-med, I said, but it's too hard. I don't think I can do it. Too hard, he asked, incredulous. Everything good in your life is going to be hard. Do you think any of those kids in your organic chemistry class are smarter than you? Some are, I replied. They're just working harder. If you spent all your time studying, you'd be getting A's. We both would. Dave and I look a bit alike, but our personalities are very different. He's always been more talkative and outgoing. His optimism is never ending while I've always had more difficulty believing that things would go right for me. One trait we share is that we had grown up admiring our father for being a doctor. From early in childhood, we could tell how respected he was within the family, always the one who relatives approached with concerns. We saw the appreciation that his patients had for him in funny little ways, like the small holiday gifts they sent each other, excuse me, they sent each year and we grew up with a shared desire to earn that same respect someday, to work in a field that took advantage of our innate skills while giving back to society and funding a comfortable lifestyle. In the end, we both learned that having a natural proclivity for math and science was just the very first step of many in becoming a doctor. Most of the path from undergraduate to medical doctor requires an infinite resource of grit and dedication that both David and I had to humbly cultivate over years before we fully stepped into the identity of being a doctor. I'm just gonna skip this next paragraph and put a little ellipses in there. Coming home again as interns on break, we fell into old routines like binging on snack food from the kitchen cabinets that had been well stocked by our mother in preparation for our arrival. We also discovered new habits like the medical one-upsmanship we couldn't seem to stop. And then the resident was paged away and left me to do the rest of the central line by myself. Yes, but have you ever done one on an acutely manic patient who was trying to strangle you? No, and neither have you. We were adding a ridiculous new spin to our age old sibling rivalry. On and on like this it went until eventually I think we both realized that we didn't really want to play that game for the rest of our lives. I realized that even if I had been enjoying the competition, it would be impossible to compete with David as I returned to psychiatry and he continued along the path of internal medicine. Over time, we backed away from that brotherly competition and I think we're both happier for it. At times, I envy the bond my brother and father share as medical doctors. They can celebrate victories and debate dilemmas as father and son and as a senior and junior colleague. Psychiatry can be a lonelier endeavor. I met with one of my best friends from high school, Jillian. It was unseasonably warm, and so we decided to get together by the duck pond near her house. As you can imagine, she lives near the old village of Roslyn, near the clock tower. Uh, you look exhausted, she said, pausing for a moment. Oh, sorry, uh, I think I skipped a line. Um, it felt surprisingly good just to be in the open air. You look exhausted, she said, pausing for a moment, uh, pausing for a response. She would have been a very shrewd psychiatrist if she'd been inclined to pursue it because she seemed to have a gift for seeing the truth in people and opening it up for analysis. We hugged and it felt so good to touch a human body without the clinical distance of a physical exam. That's a line that rings more true now than it 
might have a, a couple of years ago. So how are you? Tell me everything. I could only sigh and look away. What is it? What's the matter? I just don't know if I can do this. Do what? Medicine, psychiatry, all of it. It's so exhausting and isolating. I'm surrounded by people all hours of the day, and somehow I've never felt lonelier. I don't know. Maybe I should do something else. Something else? But you love it. You've loved it for years. It's who you are. She stopped me in my tracks, and I looked at her. She had known me so well and for so long that I suspected she was right. But why didn't I feel like being a doctor was who I was? As though reading my mind, she continued, you need to finish up medicine and get back to the world where you can see patients as people. I think you'll start to feel more like yourself again when you're back. I hope you're right, I said. I am, she said, smiling. Back at home the next day, my father approached me. I need to curbside consult you on a case. You do? He nodded. Middle-aged woman, depressed, had previously done well on fluoxetine. Says it stopped working. I'm thinking of trying her on duloxetine next. Is that a good idea? I asked more about the woman and what predisposed her to depression. He told me about the kinds of symptoms she had been having and what other medications she was on. We discussed potential side effects and even the risk of drug-drug interactions from her cardiac regimen. Still, it seems like it's worth a shot to me. How do you dose that drug? I usually start out at 20 milligrams and go up to 20 milligrams twice a day before titrating further to 30 milligrams in the morning and night or even higher. Very good. It's nice to have a psychiatrist in the network. I like that chapter for uh, a few reasons. Um, it's, it's probably the chapter that gives the most insight to where I come from and um, what my family is like. Um, and I also like it because it reflects that feeling that a lot of us have, not only going through medical training and psychiatric training, but also just anyone on their path, trying to find themselves, trying to find their professional success, who, the, who they're gonna become as they're out of college, out of training, out of education, uh, and feeling like you're losing a part of yourself as you gain, you absorb, in my case, this training, this experience, but at the same time, you risk feeling like part of yourself is, is sort of disintegrating. And that's a real phenomenon. And I think that that chapter is just a little uh, sort of snippet of that. Um, so what I'd like to do, it's eight o'clock. Um, I'd like to see if I'm, I'm, I'd be delighted to answer any questions or listen to any comments or, or anything, really. I'll defer to Adrian. Thank you. Adam, thank you so much. I have so many questions of my own that I want to allow room for everybody else's. Um, that was just wonderful. I mean, the book is so incredibly well-written, you know, accessible, but insightful and full of, you know, perceptive uh, insights about the reality of what you've been going through. Um, I guess I'll start by asking a very Temple Sinai centric question, which is, can you uh, elaborate a bit more for us on how growing up in Roslyn and your experiences at Temple Sinai may have shaped your, you know, evolution in general and the writing of this book more specifically? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think there are, there are a couple of elements there that I'll, I'll uh, touch upon. One is Roslyn in general as a community and a place to grow up. You know, Roslyn's like a, a wonderful place. Um, I, 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 this audience can appreciate uh, the wonderful aspects of it, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's a very safe environment for a kid to learn how to be a uh, a person. Uh, I, that sounds very um, simple, but it's, it's not. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I'm obviously lucky to have grown up in the family that I did and the community in terms of Temple Sinai uh, from a very early age, uh, you know, the age that my little kids are now, uh, or at least my older son is, um, you know, I, I feel like being in a place like Temple Sinai conveyed a certain sense of doing right by others, right? So being a good member of your group, of your class, of your uh, friendship, that kind of thing. Um, so I think probably the combination of my family, Roslyn and Temple Sinai and all of those things together, I think somewhere along the way, some of that uh, 
landed. Uh, and I, I think that that's part of why I wanted to go into medicine. Part of it, uh, as I alluded to in the chapter, was having to do with this admiration toward what our dad did, which is cardiology. But, but in psychiatry, uh, I was able to carve out a path where I was able to focus on um, people's stories. And that really appealed to me. And I think you can draw, it's not a straight line, but you can draw a line from my early days at uh, the nursery school all the way to where I am uh, now. And um, so I, I do think that there's something there. And, you know, Rosalind, the other very concrete part about all of this is that uh, Rosalind has a wonderful education system. Uh, it also encourages people, it drives people to compete and do well. Um, I probably needed that, uh, I think. Um, to you know, get into a, a good school like Brown, you, you have to like work really. You have to be really smart, uh, smart enough anyway. But uh, work more important, much more important than that. You have to work and work and work and try to do really well in all these uh, classes. And uh, and that idea really, if I didn't have it by the time I went to college, I needed to cultivate it in college because you need to do that just to get into medical school and then on to residency. So. I, you know, for in all those ways, I do think that Rosalind and Temple Sinai and, you know, uh, of course, the backdrop of it all, my home life and family was uh, the foundation. Adam, thank you. Um, folks, you can unmute yourselves um, and you can either raise your hands physically or electronically and I'm happy to call on you or you can type questions into the chat. Um, if you're a little shy, I certainly have more questions <laughs> until you uh, come out of your shells. I mean, I guess, uh, to, you know, until someone else speaks up, which I'm sure they will. Um, a fundamental question I have, Adam, and it's a very basic question is how do you ever truly get used to doing what you're doing, especially as a psychiatrist? I mean, I always think that of, of medical doctors in general, because it's so incredibly taxing physically, you know, mentally and emotionally, but how do you ever accommodate all of the kind of disorientation and the you know just overwhelming nature of what you must encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? I think to um, if I'm I, I want to be frank. I think that um, if you do anything over and over and over again, I think human nature is become is to become desensitized to it. And so I actually believe that the the biggest risk that doctors face, in, including psychiatrists is to stop caring, uh, uh, you know, is to become so numb to it that it doesn't bother you when a patient isn't doing well or that you don't, you know, worry that a patient won't do well, that kind of thing. Um, what you have to do along the way in terms of protecting yourself is to learn how to compartmentalize and that goes in both directions. So when I'm at work, I have to be able to shut off that part of my brain that's thinking about, you know, whether my kids are doing okay at, at their preschool, or, you know, whether uh, that thing is getting taken care of at the house, what, what have you. And when I'm home at home, I need to be able to shut off that part of my brain that's worrying about Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, how they're doing, if they're able to, um, to, were they able to get that medicine I prescribed? Or are they having any side effects? You know, if you only thought about how every one of your patients was doing, you wouldn't have room in your life for uh, the parts of your life that are very valuable to me, um, uh, family and, uh, you know, um, being able to uh, be more at ease. So I think it's a two-way street. There's, there's both the need to become, uh, like I said, to be able to compartmentalize the difficult roles and also uh, the need to not become so numb to it that you don't, that you cease being a human empath, that you stop empathizing with the, the people that you're meant to help. Beautifully put, Adam. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat. How can you deal with the mistrust that older people have about psychiatry? That's a great question. And uh, it happens to be from my beloved Aunt Judy. So uh, it means that much more to me. Um, you know, the fact is that psychiatrists can't generally help uh, a lot of people period. They can help a lot of people, period. Um, convincing or bringing someone to the point of wanting to be helped by a psychiatrist is a very tall order. Um, and so 
I don't know that there's a right answer there, but what I try to do is never, never, ever, ever, ever uh, do I find myself or allow myself to be a salesman for what I'm trying to do, right? So I never want to persuade a patient to do what I think is the best treatment option. Uh, what I need to try to do, you know, thankfully I'm in, I've, I've, I've gotten myself to a role where the patients that I'm seeing, they don't wanna have to be coming in for a particular treatment, but they are choosing to come in or their family member has encouraged them to come in. So they're coming in. There are some psychiatrists that see people on locked units, et cetera, et cetera. So thankfully uh, in my current role, I don't have that pressure of treating people entirely against their will. But I certainly have reluctant patients sometimes, patients who don't believe in whatever I might be offering. And so I, I always have to guard against feeling like I am convincing them to do it. Uh, a much better approach I find is to try to align with the patient and say, what are your goals? What are, what's important to you? Um, try to understand what actually they want. And if it's something that I have the capacity to offer. And so uh, usually it's an information gathering kind of thing. And I, and I, I, tr I really try to make sure that the patient understands that the power to decide to do something or not do something is entirely theirs. Uh, and, and they can stop at any point. They can change course, their life and their body and their brain and their mind. And so that's how I try to approach it. I'm not sure that I'm always successful. Uh, and I certainly have failed to, um, you know, help people sometimes uh, if, if they haven't been open to it. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for that candid response. Um, and, you know, while we're waiting for more questions, can you tell us, oh, wait, sorry, one just popped up in the chat, but we'll get to that in a second. But maybe you can just tell us also about what you found to be um, both, both the most enjoyable and the most challenging parts of writing committed. And yeah. then Susan, I will get to your question next. Thank you. So one of the most enjoyable things was being able to go back because the, the, the story takes place between 11 and seven years ago and being able to go back and circle back to all my classmates, including uh, my wife, who I met in that training and relive some of the memories that, that they had, get their perspective on how things went and remember them one of the things that I did as a literary technique was I included these interludes that were chats, like text chats, but they happened to be through Gmail. But the point is I was able to, I, I went back and I reread all these conversations that I had 10 years ago with the woman that would become my wife, with my brother, with my friends, uh, and rereading them and remembering what it was like uh, was a really wonderful thing. And then the other element that I loved was just that I'd never, I, I've written, I've written books before, but I've never been through this machine, this big publishing machine where there's a publicist and a marketing person and uh, the, someone designed this cover. I didn't have anything to do with, you know, the cover and uh, everything that went into it uh, and getting to do things like this, you know. Um, so, so there were so many surprises along the way. Uh, the, book, the book was in People Magazine. I don't know if anyone reads People Magazine anymore, but it's uh, really exciting to see a picture and the book cover in People Magazine. It was like a really weird and wonderful thing. So those kinds of surprises were really fun. The most difficult part of writing the book was, quite honestly, that I had to, to, to write an engaging, entertaining, interesting book. I had to create arcs. I had to take truth. The book is based on a kernel of truth, but I had to, to make it so that those storylines show growth and development and change. And everybody in the book, there were so many teachers and so many people in my life that didn't get their own sort of character in the book but they contributed to my life at that time. So fitting in all of these important people in my life and then making sure that as a reader, you know, you're right, I'm typing away, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, but then actually making sure that the reader is reading it and seeing the storyline develop and come to completion. Like that's something I've never, you know, I, I'm a writer now, I've always been a writer, but like that's something that I've never written a memoir like this before. So taking your real life and, and 
forming it onto this shape of the memoir was a really hard thing. And, and that was the most challenging aspect of it. Thank you. That sounds challenging. Uh, thanks, Adam. Okay. Uh, we have many people out there who have mental illness, mental issues, schizophrenia, et cetera, and they are walking the streets. They don't want treatment. This is a problem because you can't force people to get help. Any suggestions on how society in this country can address this problem, even their own friends and family can't do anything? Yeah, this is a this is a really complicated question because it's a major problem and something that I certainly um, don't have the the definite answer to. I can tell you that the the problem starts with how we um, basically how we try to take care of people who are severely mentally ill and how we fail at that as a society. So whether or not more resources and a different approach would be helpful. You know, um, I appreciate that that uh, it's problematic when uh, 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 someone with severe mental illness is not engaging in the system to get better and to, to um, feel better and therefore also not, you know, be, um, as you say, uh, sort of um, walking the streets. Um, but we also have to have a system that helps those people remain in care. Uh, part of that is on my field. My field has to develop drugs that are more tolerable that patients will want to take even when they have something as severe as schizophrenia. Uh, so that's on the physician scientists within my field. And part of it is, you know, societal structure. You know, we don't do a good job of making sure that patients can remain in the community and in good care, you know, that there are people taking care of them that they have access to emergency resources when they need them without it escalating to the point where someone has to, where the police have to be called or that they have to go to the emergency department. Um, so it's a major issue and I don't, I don't claim to have the answer, but I know that we're certainly as a society not doing right by these people uh, as you, as you allude to them. And, and that makes it, um, that's a fa failure on the entire society's part. Adam, thanks. Um, Amy, I see your hand. I just have one or two more questions in the chat, if you can bear with me. Um, what impact have you observed the pandemic has had on patients that you see, such as an increase in stress, anxiety, isolation, et cetera? Yeah, there, thank you, uh, Carol. Um, there have been two major impacts. One is on people who already were diagnosed with mental health disorders, things like depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, any number of things that are, are, have been worsened because their routines, their lives have been interrupted and disrupted just like everyone's has. And the other are, are people who are newly diagnosed. Um, there's been a lot of new research that's been consistent with the idea that uh, there's been a sharp rise in things like depression and anxiety diagnosed for the very first time among especially young and teenage girls. Uh, uh, that's where the, the, the problem seems to be the most severe, um, but, it's, but it's across society. And, you know, the pandemic has been hard on pretty much everyone, um, but it's, it's, it is definitely uh, revealing itself. This is like a hidden um, cost of the pandemic that is becoming more and more prevalent and more obvious as we uh, continue to move further and further into it and hopefully get to another side of it. Yeah, Thanks, it's a problem. Adam. There's a major question in the chat, but Amy, why don't you ask your, uh, why don't you verbalize your question? You'll have to unmute and then I'll get to the, the next question in the chat. There you go. Hey, Adam, um, welcome Hi. back to Sinai. I don't know if you remember me your computer teacher from Harbor Hill. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, and Adam, I should add that Amy is temple president also. <laughs> wow. So nice to see you. It's very nice to see you. Um, and I see your mom's there and your dad. Yeah. I see everyone. Yep. Um, it's, your, it's fabulous. Um, I wanted to know if you're seeing more young people having issues um, with the with Facebook, Instagram, all of the social media, and yeah. you know, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, thank you so much. So it, it's so great to see you on this call, and uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I do I do primarily work with adults. My wife is a child psychiatrist, uh, and and so I this is a question where I feel like she would be a better person to answer. But that being said, I, I think that these things are actually. Uh, potentially problematic in the sense that we don't really know how they impact us at a societal level and at an individual level over time. It doesn't feel like they're having a good net impact. It feels to me like they're having a, a negative impact. Uh, really coincidentally to your question, uh, I don't know, it might have just been a week ago or so. I just decided for the first time in my life ever, I decided, you know, it's been a few months since this book came out. I was doing a lot of like promotional tweeting and that kind of thing. And I said, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm just going to stop doing that. And you know what, I'll just take a break from all of that. So I, I deactivate temporarily, probably, but I deactivated Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. I, I got and I was expecting to go through some kind of emotional withdrawal from these things. And I was actually delighted. I've been so far delighted that I don't miss it at all. Uh, in fact, I'm reading more, I'm, I'm reading like newspapers more and um, long form stuff. And, and I, I think that this is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with as a society. I don't know exactly how we're going to solve it, uh, because these areas are not open to being regulated or even studied, frankly, in a, in a really open way. These are generally private corporations. Um, I mean, publicly traded, some of them, but 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 they're not really like uh, open to uh, scientists saying, hey, you know, this is really bad for kids or something like that. So there's probably a place for all technology as long as it's uh, coming from a place of good and not a place of uh, harm. So it will to be determined, I would say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, another question that came through, which is certainly apropos, uh, do you see organized religion as a help or a hindrance in your work? Well, first of all, I have to say that I shouted out my beloved Aunt Judy and Sheldon, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to say you're my beloved Uncle Sheldon. That's just what I'm going to say. And you're going to have to deal with that. And we'll talk about it some other time. Um, but to your question, which is an excellent question, uh, do you see organized religion as a help or a hindrance? Something that um, people may or may not know is that religion engagement in a religious community is actually considered a safety factor when I'm doing a suicide assessment risk, for example. Um, so if uh, I have to see someone in the emergency room that's been come, they've been brought in because they expressed suicidal thoughts. Uh, when I'm trying to evaluate, are they safe? Are they okay? Are they okay to go home with their family? Are they need, do they need to come to the hospital? That kind of decision-making. They get um, sort of a, one of the, the risk factors that counts against involuntary treatment is if they're actively engaged in a religious community. So the field, from an agnostic standpoint, the field identifies religious engagement as a social construct as a really positive thing. Um, one way or another, very often uh, people with severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia, can sometimes develop uh, religious delusions, um, delusions, thoughts that are not true about, that have to do with religion. It becomes really complicated, for example, if you're working with a patient who identifies themselves as the Messiah, for example, um, because uh, it's uh, that's that's a that's a kind of delusion that's very challenging to work with in a, uh, in a in a way. So there are elements where religiosity and mental health are uh, intertwined in a negative way. I would I would say. All of that being said, it's a symptom that you um, you treat as best you can, respectfully as you can. Generally speaking, I try to meet patients where they are, and if a patient feels like religion, Judaism or any other religion is a part of their life, and it's important to them, then it's important to me for them to have that and be able to participate in that in the most you know, profound way that they can. And if someone is agnostic or atheist or even anti-religion, it's not my job to persuade them otherwise. You know, my job is to uh, acknowledge how they feel about it. That's a great question, though. Thank you. 
Adam, thank you. Um, I'll do a last call for questions as I ask my own last question for now, which is what's next, Adam? I mean, obviously continuing with your career as a psychiatrist, are there any other books uh, you know, on the docket or anything else like that planned for future? Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, for years, uh, really literally years, I've had a couple of open projects um, that I'm trying to work on specifically for my kids, uh, private projects, uh, so much so that originally uh, one was aimed just at my son and then we had a second son and I'm like, oh, I'm really behind on that project. I never finished it for Max and now I need to do it for the two boys. But um, so I, I, I hope to get to that uh, and really do a, a, a job on it and do a good job for that for them. Um, and then one thing I'll say is that this experience, um, long and complicated as it's been, I've been working on this book for like two years, essentially, it hasn't made me want to write another book necessarily, but it has made me believe that speaking of delusions, it made me believe I can do almost anything, you know, so I have ideas like maybe I should write that screenplay that I had this idea about, you know, maybe I should do this other thing. And there's literally no reason that I can't do it. Uh, besides that, I might not do it, you know, in other words, like I could do it and try and fail, and that's okay. And I could do it. And maybe there's a 1% chance it succeeds. And that would be great, you know, so if I have that attitude, that's something that I'm so grateful about the book and the experience about the book is that I now view much of life in that way, uh, is that I, I, I've lost a, a fear of rejection and, you know, I, I have a certain um, drive to just sort of try things as I, as I feel like it. Well, that sounds like a gift for sure. And uh, <laughs> I will say that your presence here tonight has been a gift to us, Adam. So I can't thank you enough for sharing not just the book, but your, you know, your wisdom, your your heart and soul with us, which it really feels like you have. And we're so, so grateful to you. Uh, needless to say, please keep us posted about next steps. And if you do write that screenplay or anything else along those lines, come back and talk to us again, hopefully in person, um, even better and come and visit us when you're in Roslyn next. And um, as always, it's wonderful to see our Temple Sinai folks. Uh, stay tuned for more programming details and a forthcoming program brochure. And um, Adam, most importantly, stay well and our very, very best wishes to you. And thanks so, so much to you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Good night, everyone. We'll see you soon.